Hi guys, this is Tensor. Welcome to the Rust Snake tutorial. So today we're going to be building a game of Snake that looks a bit like what I'm playing right now. Now I decided to do another Snake game because I feel that Snake is actually the perfect program to write given how much information that we've looked at thus far. Not only is it a really good program to think about right now because it uses all of the things that we've already talked about, but it will also help us introduce a few new ideas such as namespaces and error reports. All right guys, so let's get started here. This snake game has multiple different components. Let's kind of break them down. We have this snake here and I have it, just so that you know, I have it moving quite slow and the actual live version will be quite a bit faster. The snake game is composed of four main things. First one is obviously the snake. If our snake eats an apple, it will grow by one length and we control the snake by its head. When we push an arrow button, the head will move up or down or left or right. Also say for instance, the snake is going to the left like it is right now. If I push the right key, it won't be able to go backwards because if it was, it would cause the game to uh, enter a fail state because the snake cannot actually touch itself. If I was to run this snake into itself, it will die. Game over. So you have to restart. Also, if the snake hits the wall, we die. So those are the two main failure states for this game. So the second component is obviously the apple. The apple will appear at random places. With this game, you notice that the apple actually appears at the same place every single time we start the game. The same with the snake. The snake will appear at at a fixed place every single time we restart the game. So our third component are our walls. We just want to have these uh, rectangles that go around the entire border of our game board. Of course, there are various other types of snake. We could make it so that the snake could pass through the walls, but I kind of like this style best. And finally, we have our game board itself, the actual 2D plane that the snake moves along and that the apple spawns in. All right, so to get started here, we want to type in cargo new. And then the name of our game is just going to be snake and we're going to pass in the dash dash bin flag and this will create a binary for us. So as per usual, we have our simple main.rs file and you can see here that it's just got a simple hello world program written inside of it. What we want to look at right now though is our cargo.tumble file and we want to add two dependencies to this. The first dependency is rand as in random. So this is a library that will allow us to deal with the random numbers for our apple. And the second dependency is piston window. And this will allow us to render our elements with a UI as well as deal with some of the game logic. Now notice that we are using these asterisks for the version numbers. So normally you'd put the version numbers here. If we use an asterisk like this, it will choose the latest version. So if we go back into our terminal, we can type in cargo update here and this will update all of our dependencies in the cargo.lock file. So now we can jump back into our cargo.tumble file here. And if we go to the lock file here, we can search out the two libraries that we're looking for. So for instance, if I'm looking for RAND, you can see here package RAND, and this is the latest version, which is 0.3.18. So now I can copy that and I can replace the asterisk here with it. For piston window here, we can see that our latest version is 0.74.0. And we can copy that and put it in our cargo.tomo as well. Now, the reason it's important to use static versions is just in case the library actually changes. If the syntax changes, then our game will not work properly anymore because we will be behind the API. Now, normally libraries try to keep a consistent API, but sometimes it does change. All right, so now to get our dependencies, we can type in cargo build and this will build the entire project as well as bring in the dependencies and compile them. And while that's going on, we can jump back into main here. This is how we actually look at importing external libraries into our main namespace or into our program. So we want to type in extern crate. So these two keywords here and then the name of the library. So rand is one of them and then the other one is our piston window crate. And once everything has compiled inside of our terminal here, these errors should go away. All right, so now that our error codes have gone away, we can talk about how we want to actually implement the game. The first thing we want to do is create a few helper functions. So we're going to create a new file here called draw.rs, and this is going to be inside the source folder here with our main.rs file. We also want to come back into our main.rs file and type in mod 
draw with a semicolon. What this will do is it will tell the compiler that we have another namespace, or rather another file that we need to connect to our main.rs file, and that is our draw.rs file here. So this will also give us linting in this file, so it will check for errors and stuff, which is nice, which will make writing our code a little bit easier for us. Now the imports that we want to make inside of our draw file here are piston window, inside of it we want to bring in rectangle, we want to bring in context, and we want to bring in G2D. And we can actually see what these things look like by going peek at definition. So our rectangle here, you can see here it says contains the definition of a rectangle. Now our context here is just the struct here, and you can see that it has a few fields on it. So it has a viewport, it has a view, it has a transform, and it has a draw state. So this is what essentially allows us to draw 2D content, or at least it gives us the context to draw the 2D content. And then this G2D import is what actually draws it. So this is our uh, graphics buffer. That's what it stands for is graphics 2D. The other thing that we brought in here was the types for color. If we peek at this, you can see here it's just a type and it's just an array with uh, four elements in it. Each are type color component. And you can see here, color component is an F32. Now the first thing we wanna do is create a block size constant. So we're using the keyword const. Constants in Rust, like many other programming languages, require that we use uppercase letters. And we need to specify the type annotation. That's mandatory with all constants. And then of course we set them equal to a value. So in this case, we want it to be equal to 25. Our blocks will scale up 25 pixels, or at least by a factor of 25 pixels, every single time we create a block. And you can fiddle around with this number. Now, next we wanna create a function here called toCord. And this will take in a game coordinate, which will be an I32. And then we want to return an F64. So what we're just doing with this helper function is taking a coordinate, then we're going to cast it to an F64 and then multiply it by our block size. So we're gonna scale it up based on this number here. Also, we're using this pub keyword. What this pub keyword does is it allows us to export this function. So this makes this function public to our entire program. All right, so now let's look at our first major helper function. This is also public, so we're using this pub here. We want to draw a block and we're inputting a color here. Then we're passing an X and a Y, both of I32. And we need to pass in the context and then a mutable graphics 2D buffer. Then we bind this GUI X and this GUI Y, and we pass it through our two chord function here to convert it by a factor of our block size here and convert it to an F64. And then we call our rectangle here. We pass in a color, and then we pass in the actual parameters for the rectangle, so this is uh, allowing us to pass in the X value, the Y value, and then the width and the height. Then we need to pass in the context transform, which we're doing right here. And then we need to pass in our G, which is our graphics buffer. All right, so next we want to create a public function called draw rectangle. Now this is just a slight modification on the draw block function that we have here. And we're still passing in a color and the X and the Y but next we're also passing in the width and the height. So what this will do is allow us to draw rectangles essentially. And the only real difference is that we come into this rectangle here and we just take the block size and we multiply it by the width, cast it as an F64 and the height cast it as an X64 so that we can actually control the size of our rectangle. Of course, we're just going to mainly use this for the sides of our board. These are our helper functions. Uh, we may need one more later, but that will come later. So now let's create a file called snake.rs. In this file, we're going to tie most of the logic that we need to actually create our snake. All right, so here are our imports. First, we're importing from the standard library collections, a type called linked list. A linked list allows pushing and popping elements from either end. Uh, basically, it's sort of like a vector, except it's very easy to get the head or the tail of a linked list. Next, we're bringing in our context and our graphical buffer again, and we're also bringing in the color type. We're also bringing in the draw block function that we just defined here in our draw.rs file. We also wanna jump back into our main.rs file and type in mod snake, and this will tie our snake.rs file to our main.rs file. 
All right, so next we want to create a constant for our snake color, and it's an array of four elements. Each element corresponds with a part of the color spectrum. So the first item is our red element. The second item is our green element. The third item is our blue element. And then the fourth element is our opacity. So we want to have a green snake. So I put this as dot 80. You could put this as one and it would be pretty green. And we want it to have 1.0 opacity. The next thing we want to do is create an enum for direction. So this will handle the direction of the snake as well as how our keyboard inputs interact with the snake. So we want the snake to be able to go up, down, left, and right on our screen. We also want to implement a method for our enum here. So this is the method that will essentially match the directions so that if the snake is going up and I try to hit down, the snake will not be able to go down. So the way this works is we are, have a public function here, takes in a reference to self and outputs a direction. Then we match on a deref of self and we say, okay, if direction is up, then pass back direction down. If direction is down, pass back direction up, so on and so forth. Next, we want to create a struct real quick for our block type. So we just wanna have an X and a Y in here, both of I32. This doesn't need to be public because we're not gonna export it anywhere. All right, so now we wanna create a struct for our snake. And inside of our snake, we wanna have the following states. The direction that the snake is currently traveling in. We wanna have the body of the snake, which will be a linked list of blocks. Then we wanna have the tail, which will be an option block. So this is important because we want to have our tail be a actual value when we eat an apple because when we eat an apple then the tail doesn't actually get deleted when the snake moves forward. Now we want to create an implementation block for a snake so that we can create methods. We're going to create a function called new or a method called new. This will take in an x and a y value and output our snake and we'll say here create a mutable body which will be a linked list of blocks. And we'll use linked list new to create it. And then we'll use this pushback method, appends an element to the back of a list. So essentially what we're doing here is we're setting up the default snake. So when the game restarts, our snake is going to have a length of three, our first block being X and Y, our second block being an X plus one, and then our third block being Y and then X plus two. So our snake will be horizontal with the X and Y coordinate it will also start out moving in the direction of right and the tail will be none. So it will be exactly three blocks long and it will be moving to the right. Body equals body. So we're just using that uh, shorthand to just say body equals body because we're already using the name body here. And our field is also called body. And then tail we're setting to none by default. We want to create a function called draw. So this will take in a reference to self, the context, and our graphical buffer. And then we will iterate through our list. So we'll say for block inside of reference to self dot body, we'll call our draw block function on each of the blocks of the snake with our snake color inside of it. So this will render out a green snake. Now we want to create a head position function here. So this will take a mutable self variable and then it will output a tuple of i32s. So we'll find the head of our snake by using this self.body.front method. And you can see here that it actually says provides a reference to the front element of the list or none if there is none. Now we're also using this other method on top of it. It says moves the value v out of option v. So essentially what this does is it helps us get rid of the option enum without having to explicitly write some error handling. So then our return will just be head block X and head block Y. We're going to create a move forward function. This will take in a mutable snake reference. Then it will take in a DIR, which will be an option with a direction inside of it. First we'll match on DIR to get the option away from it. If it matches some D, then we wanna set our snake direction to D. Otherwise, we're going to pass back none. And we're going to say let last x and last y, which will both be i32, equal our head position. So we're going to call this method here to get the front of our snake. 
And then we are going to match on our actual snake direction. We're going to bind it to this new block variable. If we're going in direction up, then we're going to create a new block. And this is going to end up on the head of our snake. We're going to move forward in the negative y axis. The reason why this seems like it's inverted, the way it works is we have our origin here. And as you go down, this is actually the positive y axis. For instance, if our screen is only 600 pixels in height, then we would go down 600 pixels and that would be, be like 600. So if our snake's going up in that case, it's actually going downwards across the x-axis. So that's why we're uh, decrementing this value by negative 1. If we're actually moving downwards, we're moving up the y-axis in this case. Now left and right are as you would actually imagine them. For left, we're subtracting 1, and then for right, we're adding 1. We're going to push this new block into the front of our snake. So like I said before, when our snake moves, we're actually removing the last block and adding a new front block. So we're pattern matching here to get our new block, the block that we're going to add. So if we turn right, for instance, then the block will be on the right of the snake. But if we're moving in, say, the up direction, then the block will be on the front of the snake. So self.body, and then we push this into the front of our list. And then we look at the back block. So let remove block here. We call self.body pop back, which will pop off the back part of our linked list. And then we use that unwrapped method again so that we don't have an error. And then we set self.tail equal to sum removed block. All right, so the next thing we want to do is actually write a method that will allow us to take in our snake or a reference to our snake and then get a direction. So get the direction the snake's moving in. All right, so you'll notice here that we're getting an error here that says cannot move out of the barred content. Now this is happening because we want to actually implement copy and clone for our direction enum. So we're going to write derive copy clone. And we also want to do this for our block here. We want to implement clone and debug. So debug is mainly so that we can just debug it if we want to. But uh, the clone trait will allow us to uh, clone the item when we need to use it. And you'll see here that the error goes away because that's what we're doing here. We're actually cloning a direction. Now we also need uh, partial EQ uh, because we want to be able to uh, do equivalencies here. All right, so we want another method. This one's called next head. This will take in a reference to self. It will also take in an option direction called DIR. And then it will output a uh, tuple of i32s. So we'll say let head x and y equal i32s. And then we'll get the head position using our head position method up here. And then we'll say, OK, well, we have a uh, mutable moving direction. And we'll get the snake direction with this. Then we're going to match on the direction that we're passing into this method. So if we have a direction, uh, some d, for instance, then we're going to set this moving direction here, the one that we got from the snake, to the direction uh, that we're passing into this method. Then we're going to match again on this new moving direction, if there is a new one, or the old one, if, if it's the same. Return back these coordinates. Now this is just to uh, help us find the head a little bit better, because as we're moving around and as we're hitting uh, keys, uh, for instance, if we turn then the head will actually be in a different place than we expect it to be. So this will help with accuracy. Finally, we have two more methods we want to create. Create another public function called restore tail. This will take in a reference to our mutable snake. Then we'll create a block which will be based off of our tail, which will clone. And we're going to use this unwrap method as well to deal with the potential for errors. And then we're going to uh, push our cloned tail into the back of our body. So basically, you remember the tail doesn't get rendered unless we eat an apple. So if we eat an apple, this method will be run and the tail will be pushed into our linked list body. This is actually the method that being with our snake growing in size.
Finally, our last method and the last actual uh, line of code that we want to write inside of our snake uh, namespace is this method called overlap tail. So this will take in our snake, so a reference to our snake, and then it will take in an x and a y, and then we will uh, pass back a boolean. So we'll create a mutable value, then set it to equal to zero. Then we'll iterate through our body, our snake body. And we'll check to see if x equals block.x and if y equals block.x. So in other words, if our snake is overlapping with any other part of its actual body, then we'll return true. Otherwise, we're going to increment ch. Then we're going to check if ch equals the length of our snake body minus 1. So basically what we're doing with this part of our method is checking to see if our snake is actually overpassing the tail, so the, the back of the snake itself. Say you have the snake uh, rotating in a circle. If the tail and the uh, head overlap in the same block, there actually is a moment there where the head will actually be in that block and so will the tail. And we don't want this to cause a failure state because that tail should also, you know, will just move as soon as the head actually occupies that block. So there's a moment there where it's a little ambiguous and we want to make it consistent. So in this case, this is what this part of the function is doing. So that's it for our snake file here. Now we want to create a file called game. As with our other files, we want to come into our main file and just type in mod game to link it up with our project. Then we want to import all of the piston window here. So that's why we're using this asterisk. It's saying, okay, everything inside of this namespace we want to import. Then we have piston windows types color. Then we want to go into our random. So remember we brought in that random library. We want to get out thread RNG here. It allows us to create a thread local random number generator seated by the system. So essentially we're using our operating system to create a random number. And we're also bringing in this RNG here, which is actually a trait. You can see here it's a random number generator trait. Then we also want to bring in our snake direction and then the snake itself. So the direction enum and the snake struct. And then we want to bring in our draw block and our draw rectangle functions. So we want to create three constants, food color. This will be red, so 0.8 and it will have an opacity of one. Then we want to create border color, which will be completely black. So each number will be 0 .00, 0 .00, 0 .00, and 0 .00, 0 .00, with an opacity of one. And then we want to have our game over screen, which will be 0 0.9, so it'll be red again. It will have an opacity of 0.5, so we'll still be able to see through it. Then we also want to create two other constants. One's called moving period. And this is essentially the frames per second that our snake will move at. And then our restart time is one second. When we hit a failure state with our snake, this will pause the game for one second before resetting it. And if you find this to be too fast, you can fiddle around with it. Uh, the one I showed you before was 0.5, so it or twice a second, whereas this is moving 10 times a second. All right, now we're going to create a new struct called game. This will have a snake in it. Then it will have food exists. This will be a boolean. So if food exists on the board, then we don't need to spawn more. And then we'll have the food x and y coordinates. Then we'll have the width and the height of the actual game board. Then we'll have the game state. So this is a boolean. So then we'll have the wait time, which is this restart time up here. Where we want to make an implementation block for our game so we can create some methods here. We're gonna create a new method so that we can instantiate a new game. This will take in the width and the height of the actual game board itself. And then we'll output a game, which will then run the snake new function at 2.2. Two. So up here, if this is the origin up here at the corner, then 2.2 two will be two units out and then two units down. So the snake should start somewhere around here if our board was pressed up against this, um, depending on how big the units are, of course. Then our waiting time will be zero, so the snake will automatically start moving. Food exists will be true, so the food will spawn, and it will spawn at this x and y. Then our width and height are, of course, the size of the board. And then our game over will be false. When the game's running, this will be false, and then once we hit a wall or we hit ourselves, it'll turn to true. Now we want to create another method called key pressed. This will allow us to uh, basically figure out whether or not uh, 
the user has pressed the key and then react accordingly. So key press takes in immutable game self and then it takes in a key type and let's look at the key. So you can see here key has all the different keys inside of it and you can use all of these uh, key codes if you want to. And we're saying if game over then we want to just quit out of this. But if it's not then we want to match on key and if key up then we're going to go up. If key down, we're going to go down. If key left, we're going to go left. And if key right, we're going to go right. Then we're going to check DIR. We're going to say if DIR unwraps, so we're going to unwrap it from the uh, option enum. And we're going to see if it's equal to snake head direction and is opposite. Then we're going to quit out of this function. So uh, in other words, if the snake is moving up and we try to hit down, then nothing will happen. So that's where this head direction uh, method comes in. And then the opposite method, which we're calling here, is the first method I believe that we wrote. You can see here that it's our method that's inside of direction here. Alright, so then we're calling this update snake method, which we haven't implemented yet. Before we update the snake though, we want to create this public draw function. This takes in a reference to our game board, takes in the context, and it takes in our graphics buffer. So first we're going to call self.snake.draw. And what this will do is, as we wrote it, it iterates through our linked list and then draws blocks based on those linked lists. Then we're going to check and see if food exists. If this comes back as true, then we're going to draw a block with the food color and the self food X and Y. And then we're going to come down here and we're going to draw the borders. So our first border will be uh, starting at the origin here, 0, 0. And then it will have self width which will be the X axis. So like this across the top here and it will have uh, one depth in the Y axis. So it'll be coming down one unit like this. And then we pass in the context and then the uh, buffer. Then our next border will be uh, starting at zero and then uh, self height, which will be down here somewhere. And it's self height minus one and then we go across to self width so around here then we have uh, our zero zero again and this one will come down the y-axis so it'll go from the origin all the way down to uh, the lower left corner and then finally we have our self width minus one so this will go all the way across and then all the way down and it will be the border across the bottom and finally we run another check and we say okay if, if game over then we want to draw our game over screen. So this will cover our entire screen. All right, so now we're gonna make an update function. We pass in our game state here as a mutable game state. And then we're gonna pass in a time, so the time that's passed as an F64. Then we're gonna say waiting time plus equals delta time. So we're gonna iterate our waiting time. And if the game is over, then we're going to say if waiting time is greater than restart time, we'll, uh, restart the game. And this is a method that we need to write yet. Otherwise, we're just going to return. And uh, if not self food exists, so if, in other words, if the food does not exist, then we're going to call this add food method. If self dot waiting time is greater than moving period, so the point one second, then we're going to update the snake. All right, so now we're going to check and see if the snake has eaten. And we're going to pass in mutable game state here. So we're going to find the X and Y of the head using our head position method. Then we're going to check if the food exists and if food X equals head X and if food Y equals head Y. And if the head overlaps with our food, then we're going to say, okay, food doesn't exist anymore. We're going to pass back false. And we're going to call our restore tail function. So in other words, our snake is going to grow one block. So now we want to check our collision with this method. So check if snake alive, pass in our uh, reference to self and then a option of direction here. And we're going to pass back a boolean. So if uh, next x and next y equals uh, the next head. So in other words, uh, we're going to look and see uh, the new snake head. Then we're going to check and see if that snake head overlaps with the tail. And as I explained before, there is a moment where that uh, head will overlap with the tail. And then we'll return false. If we go out of the bounds of the window, then the game will end and 
uh, it will restart after a second. And now let's actually add the food. Add food, this is the method that we were calling up here. We take in mutable game state, and then we create an RNG element, and then we call our thread RNG here, so our RNG maker. We want an X and a Y, and we call our a generation of range. Uh, for the X, it'll be from one to the width size minus one. Y, it will be one, and this should be height. So it will be uh, one and then to the height minus one. And then we'll check and see if the snake is overlapping with the tail. So we're only doing this because we don't want the snake to overlap with our apple. Then we will set our food X and Y here. And then we'll set self food exists to true. All right, so our update snake function, we'll take in the mutable game state and then a direction, option direction. And we'll check if self check if snake is alive with the direction in it. And if it is, then we move the snake forward and then we check to see if it's eating something. If it's not, then our game over becomes true. And then we set the waiting time to 0, 0.0. So in other words, we end the game if it's not true and uh, the snake stops and we reset our waiting time. We wait a second and then we restart the game. And to do that, we have to make a restart function here. Here's our restart method. It takes in mutable game state then we just say, okay, self.game is a new snake. Uh, self.waiting time is 0, 0.0. Self.food exists equals true. Then we uh, spawn this food at 6.4. And then we say game over to false. Now this is very similar to our new function. But the reason why we don't call the new function is that we don't want to render a new window every time the game resets. Let's go in here and set up the game and let's get it all finished. All right, so here are our imports. We want to import all of piston window. We also want to import the color type from piston window and we want to import game game. We also want to create one more helper function. So real quick, this is going to be very similar to our two chord function here, except we don't want to return an F64. Instead, we want to return a U32. You can see all this function does is it calls our two chord function and then casts the result as U32 and then returns it back. And the only reason why we want this is so that we have a little bit more precision for specific things and we'll actually get to that when we actually use it. You also want to bring that function into our main. So we want to set up our back color and we're going to set this up to be a kind of gray. So if we set this up to like 1, 1, 1, and 1, it'll be a, just a pitch black. But 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then 1. This will make red 0.5, blue 0.5, and or green 0.5, and then blue 0.5. And, and then it will be sort of a, a darkish gray. So now let's delete this println hello world. All right, so first we want to get the width and the height. We're going to set them by default to 20 and 20. And then we're going to create a mutable window, which will be a piston window. And then we're going to say window settings equals new. And we're going to create a snake game. Then we're going to say to chord U32 width, we do 20 times 25, and this will give us 500. And then the other one will also be 20 by 25. And so our window will be 500 by 500 with 20s. We could do 25 by 25 or 30 by 30, and it would also come out fine. So if we do 30, 30, our window will be 750 by 750. So this, is, this will create our game window. Then we're going to call this escape on exit. So this will basically just say if we hit the escape key while the game is open, it will exit the game. We want to build the actual window with this build method and we're going to add this unwrap function so that we deal with any errors that might come along. So now we want to create a new game. So we're going to call game new with our width and height in here. And the width and height, remember they were changed based on this two chord U32. So we're going to use a wallet binding here and we're going to say some event equal window next and let's peek at the definition of window next. Here's next event. So this will actually clean up the window. So every time the snake moves, it will clean the window. And then we're going to say if let some button on the keyboard. So if, if somebody presses a button, then we're going to call this press args and we're going to say game dot key pressed and we're going to pass the key in. Otherwise, we're going to say window.draw2d, so it'll actually draw the 2D window. We're gonna pass in the event that we got here. We're gonna pass in C and G, which is context and our uh, G2D graphics. 
We're going to clear the window and then we're going to draw the game. And then we want to call our event update here and we're going to pass in another anonymous function. So that's what these are, these two pipes. These signify anonymous functions. And we're going to run game update with our arg.dt. So this is delta time in seconds, you can see. And arg is just a piston window, updated args. So this is mostly part of the library. And that's it, guys. Our game is finished. Now we can uh, see if there are any errors. So we can run cargo check. And we see here that it actually finishes compiling. So now I can run cargo run. And hopefully we should see a snake game. And there we are. So now you see it's a lot quicker than the one I was showing earlier. Looks like the snake is a little greener than earlier. And we have these red apples. And so we, uh, we can scale the window as much as we want and kind of uh, do a bunch of other things. I was thinking about doing text in this original version, but I decided against it. Because rendering text in Piston is a little bit different than rendering other things. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I know it was a bit long and I know I kind of had to rush a bit so that I would fit everything in. It's kind of a large program. I will be uploading the Rust snake to uh, GitHub so that you guys can check out the code base if you'd like. If you enjoyed this tutorial, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, by all means, ask them in the comment section below are on one of the various social media networks that we are attached to. And if you disliked it, then, you know, by all means, downvote it as much as you'd like. All right, guys, we'll have a good night.